Um, just to kind of let you know what to expect, um, so this is the public presentation. Uh, so Kate will present, uh, and then we'll have some time for questions from the audience. Um, and then after that, uh, you all get to relax. Kate doesn't get to relax. Uh, she has to join her dissertation committee, and we will appropriately grill her for a bit, and then uh, after that, we hopefully will have a celebration. <laughs> so um, I'm Steve Pulaski. I'm uh, Kate's uh, major advisor, um, and the rest of the committee is here. Kristen uh, Nelson, Carissa Lively. I, I can't ever pronounce your last name. There we go, Slaughterback, yes, yeah. and, uh, and Vanessa, and anyway, so um, it's, it's really great uh, that you're all here and that we're having this event. I wasn't always sure we were going to be having this event. Um, uh, Kate is not your typical graduate student. Um, I first met Kate, actually, uh, she came to my doorstep. I live in Arden Hills, which is in a certain legislative district that Kate was actually running. Uh, uh, as a member of the House of Representatives and was elected uh, as one of the youngest members of the House of Representatives in Minnesota, served for six years. Kate has uh, also um, started and run the Boreas uh, Leadership Program at the Institute on the Environment. Uh, she served as the um, Chief Resilience Officer, City of Minneapolis. I mean, so you get, I mean, Normally, graduate students, uh, it's a full-time job to just write a dissertation, but Kate decided that she needed to do uh, lots of other things on top of that, start a family and, and other things. So it's, it's, it's great that, that we're here, uh, that we've got a finished product, and Kate's going to uh, talk about it. Um, so Kate started, uh, has, has varied interests, uh, ranging from politics, as we've talked about, through philosophy, biology, and parts in between. Um, I think it's, it's indicative of, of her wide interest. So she started out working on a topic on pollinators, and we morphed off of pollinators and got to deliberative transformation, which, we'll, which Kate will talk about today. But I think it's, it's indicative of her interest in what's really important for society, and for sustainability, and how do we get there. So Kate, without further ado, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for coming. We're using the microphones because we do have some folks joining us on a live stream as well as we um, have this conversation this afternoon. And before I start, I want to ask us to kind of center ourselves for the conversation. Um, think about a place that you love, the people that you love. Um, this is a picture from Minnesota, the North Shore of Lake Superior in Duluth. It's one of the places that's very dear to me and very important to us as a state and in, in the world. Um, because the topics we're talking about are kind of hard things. Um, and it's important, I think, as we start to remind ourselves why we care about things like sustainability. And it's really ultimately about the people and the places we love and their health and well-being. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today with my dissertation is how collectives drive deliberate transformation to make progress towards sustainability. And as if you've read the news at all lately, you know we have some pretty significant sustainability challenges. These are really well documented, whether it's the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment going back to the early 2000s, um, reports by the Intergovernmental pa Panel on Climate Change, the National Climate Assessment. We, we have a lot of documentation about the challenges of sustainability. We also know there's solutions possible. We, we actually kind of know what to do. Uh, we have the classic carbon wedges paper from the, uh, 2004. Um, some work out of our own Institute on the Environment here with um, solutions to reduce the impact of uh, how we grow and eat food. And a, a recent uh, publication that looks at a more wide ranging set of solutions with water, food, energy, and conservation. And just to highlight uh, the abstract of this paper, if you, you say, OK, it's possible, but achieving this hopeful vision for people in nature is attainable with existing technology and consumption pattern. Possible. We know what, that what, what we want to do is possible. However, success will require major shifts in production methods and an ability to overcome substantial economic, social, and political challenges. So that's a big question of how do we actually do this? How do we 
do what we know we need to do on, on transformation. And that's what a, a question I'm really interested in in this, in this dissertation. The other point is that transformation is coming. Um, this is the latest uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report, global warming of 1.5 degrees C, um, and showing the difference even to two degrees C is a significant impact on millions of people's lives. The fourth National Climate Assessment just came out last week. And both of these show that the world is transforming. But the question is how we're going to see that transformation. Is it going to be a forced transformation? How, to what extent will it be forced? So here we have a house years after Hurricane Sandy. We're in New York City and many places around the world talking about managing retreat from rising sea levels. It's a little bit of a forced and a deliberate transformation. Here we have uh, a photo from the campfire um, where dozens of people lost their lives in the last month. These are the kinds of things, devastating impacts on people's lives and the well-being of people and communities and societies and entire cultures um, that will be forced upon us if we don't act in the ways we need to to address climate change and other sustainability challenges. So the question isn't just how to achieve sustainability, but increasingly, increasingly how do we deliberately transform? And that's the focus and um, concern of my dissertation. So an outline of where we're going to go. This is a dissertation. We did, I did research to get here. So it's kind of classic. Uh, theoretical grounding and research questions will first, and then I'll talk about the methodology and the data I collected and how I analyzed it. Then briefly the case studies that uh, underlie it, and, and then the overall finding. So first some definitions. First sustainability is one of these words we throw around a lot. Uh, one of the most widely cited definitions comes from the Brundtland Commission, the, the World Commission on Environment Development, our common future, meeting uh, the needs of the present without compromising the needs of uh, the ability of future generations to meet their needs. This has been more um, precisely developed with um, thinking around um, inclusive well-being and maintaining that over generations, um, which depends on an inclusive understanding of wealth. And then clear, I, th this book on dynamic sustainability makes it clear, and I agree with this and include it in my definition, that justice is an essential part of sustainability, both justice in between generations, but also within generations and the ability of, of people within generations to meet their needs. And then we'll have a definition of deliberate transformation. This is still a very <laughs> live area of scholarship. I felt like I was every week having a new um, paper to cite in the dissertation. But it's, Basically, it's intentionally changing the systems in which we live, the social ecological systems in which we live in ways that bring about fundamental structural change. So that's changing key ecological elements, like the, uh, the function of ecosystems and the services we get and value from them, and then social elements like norms and values, um, rules and practices, and relationships of power and resources. And changing at least one of these elements, the relationships and the feedbacks within the system change and ultimately the structure. So some important things to remember about or know about deliberate transformations, they're not common, they're quite rare. Um, systems like to perpetuate themselves um, and, and deliberately creating transformation is, is difficult and um, rare. It's also not random. The uh, system itself impacts the kinds of transformations that are possible as well as the actors in the system um, have impact on the transformations. And we're also looking at long time scales here. We're looking at decades. Um, so the groups I've studied are not, we don't know if they're successful because we're looking at 20, 30, 50 year time frames of will we actually achieve the kind of transformations we hope to. So I went into the transformations literature, and this is a wide ranging literature. It's not a narrow uh, field, and it draws from several fields. And um, a, a lot of the basis of the literature I used looked at multiple case studies of transformations in various ways and in various contexts and tried to um, glean learnings from those, particularly about strategies and about the system overall. And they looked for um, various key patterns. And one of those key patterns are that transformations are collective work. These are things we do together. Collective such as the UN and the Paris Agreement as in, in the body, but also collective outside these official government decision-making processes with um, the kind of mobilization and uh, the pressuring our governance systems work as well. So how do we study the, the collective part of this? Many, most of the studies look at um, uh, transformation as a whole, and they look at specific strategies. Um, they, I, I'm very interested in focusing on 
the role of actors and specifically collective actors. So my overarching research question is how do collectives drive deliberate transformation to make progress towards sustainability? So there's three key definitions in here. I've already defined two of them for you, sustainability, deliberate transformations. So this idea of collectives. And I struggled with what to say, what to call these things I was studying. And I originally just used the word groups. I'm studying groups that are driving transformation. But in a lot of the literature, literature, leadership literature, that, that tends to indicate smaller groups. And I, groups smaller than what I wanted. Um, and I also thought maybe organizations. But I found these groups or collectives I study, I wanted to study went beyond official organizations or people associated with them. And they were more. They were often associated with organizations, but not fully encompassed by them. So I define a, a collective as an intentionally organized group of people identify, that identifiable by a common identity, purpose, and set of strategies. And it's often associated with, but not fully encompassed by a group. So I admit I introduced a jargon word <laughs> into my study of deliberate transformation. You know, it is some academic work. Um, so going back to the transformations literature, I tried to identify key elements of transformation and uh, deliberate transformation. And these were the ones that I identified mostly through the literature and through some data collection. One, the form of transformation over space and time. And they, the transition, the, the, trans, the literature talks about multi-phase um, processes of change and multi-level processes of change. Um, but really the idea of space and time is important in that the thing, same thing doesn't always happen at the same time or at the same scales in transformation. Uh, power increasingly is viewed as important in the literature. This literature often views power um, at, at, by applying social science theories to transformation and also developing theory or frameworks for the analysis of power in transformation. I'm really interested in power as a tool, as an ability to drive transformation and that, the question of how being really important. And, you know, as someone who comes out of having served in public office and trying to create change as an actor in a system, not uh, solely as someone studying it, power is, is central and a, an important part of um, the study. Narrative um, came out of mostly early data collection. Um, it was not something I identified in the literature, but one of my first interviews, um, narrative was something they said I missed, <laughs> and it came up in quite a few conversations. And so I went back to the literature and identified things like sense making, envisioning, um, expectation shaping, which are all related to this idea of narrative. Um, leadership from the earliest studies of transformation is identified as important. It's actually as essential. And the focus is usually on leadership strategies and on individual leaders as important in um, transformations. Since I'm studying collectives, I'm particularly interested in collective leadership and also how these collectives enable broad-based leadership from lots of people. And then finally, networks, also <laughs> described as essential throughout the literature. And they're particularly focused on how to scale transformation across um, spatial scales and also over time. And in particular, as I, as, I asked, as I look at collectives, I'm mostly interested in how collectives go about engaging with their networks to realize the benefits of, of doing so. Um, so these are my sub research, these questions support the main research question, and they're developed both um, through a view of the literature and data collection. So now we get to move to research methodology and, and the data I use. I use a case study approach. It's a qualitative approach when you're trying to understand the nuance and detail of a pretty complex topic as deliberate transformation is. Um, and I chose three case studies. And my data collection, the primary data collection, was using uh, interviewing. And I used a technique called responsive interviewing developed by Ruben and Ruben. Um, and it views the interview as a conversation amongst interviewer and interviewee. And really values um, understanding emerging out of the conversation. The people I interviewed were really high level leaders and um, thoughtful people about the work they were doing. And so I had a lot to learn from them that maybe I didn't um, know going in. So the criteria I used for selecting cases, um, that they're impacting sustainability at an, a national to international scale. And there's indications that they will continue to have impact. Um, they're working to, ch to fundamentally change, this is the transformation part, um, key institution or institutions in society, and that they differ in their strategies, approaches, organizations to facilitate comparison and contrast amongst them. And because I was going for um, uh, interviewing high level leaders in these group, I, I needed to have some understanding that I could actually secure the interviews with the people I was hoping to. 
Um, so the three collectives I chose were 350.org as a catalyst uh, for the global climate movement, Arizona State University, which is transforming itself as a university with sustainability as an essential core part of that, and the Natural Capital Project, which um, works at the boundary between science and practice to drive um, key changes in decision making. I'll go into a little more detail on these with the case studies. Um, but before I do so, how I developed the studies and the, uh, the findings, I interviewed key leaders from each of these collectives. I did a total of 34 interviews for 350. I, did, I interviewed 10 people for ASU, 13 people, and for the Natural Capital Project, uh, I interviewed 11 people. And these were um, people who had positions where they had a, a role in developing and implementing strategy and an understanding of the collective and the work they were trying to do at a pretty high level. Um, and then I wrote case studies of each collective based on this interview as well as various literature. And then I um, did an iterative process of reading, rereading the um, interview data, the case studies, and um, building the understanding really grounded in the, uh, in the interview data as well as the case studies. So now quick case studies, 350.org. Um, was start, started by the well-known uh, writer Bill McKibben, who wrote the first popular book on climate change, and six Middlebury College students. And they sensed the need for a global climate movement, but didn't see one there. Um, and they started working together, um, first doing a walk across Vermont, then the Step It Up campaign, and then 350, and saw a lot of success in people having a desire to um, be part of a global climate movement. And so they started with these like 350 demonstrations of massive support. 350 is the, um, uh, based on a Hansen 2008 paper, the safe amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We're well above it now, but that's what the, the number itself is based on. Um, they quickly ramped up more uh, confrontational tactics, as Billy Kibben said in one of my interview, because the physics demanded it of us. Um, so here we see uh, the Forward on Climate Rally poster against the Keystone XL pipeline. And then this is the Do the Math tour um, based on the idea of a carbon budget. And they're pretty clear. We're going after the fossil fuel industry. <laughs> they're, they're clear about what they're trying to do. Um, Arizona State University is uh, started in the 1800s, but um, their transformation really began with um, the hiring of Michael Crow as the president of the university. And he came in to ASU with the idea of the new American university. Um, which is documented in this book he co-wrote a few years ago and is really encompassed in their uh, charter. A Arizona State University is a comprehensive public research university measured by not by whom it excludes, but, but rather by whom it includes and how they succeed, advancing research and discovery of public value and assuming fundamental responsibility for the economic, social, cultural, and overall health of the communities it serves. Um, ASU did have... Uh, a well, it was fertile ground for this kind of work. It um, had just become, at, before Crow became president, had just become uh, the highest level research university in the country and had a pretty collaborative factory that, fa faculty that, as, as several of them said in interviews, that was willing to be led. Um, and sustainability, for purposes of this uh, study, sustainability is a core part of the uh, New American University and a core value. They, began, they started the first school of sustainability in the country. Um, and they now have over 500 sustainability scientists and scholars associated with it. Um, they have been recognized as the most innovative university in the country for four years in a row by US News and World Report. Um, and sustainability is, they serve huge numbers of students, large scales around um, issues of sustainability. The Natural Capital Project um, tries to get the consideration of the, the value of nature and ecosystem services into all uh, major decision-making processes um, in order to prove, prove the well-being of people and nature. And it started coming out of the uh, Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, and there's really uh, several friends, Gretchen Daly, Peter Kariva, Taylor Ricketts, and, and Steve Plesky came in very early on, um, who were each at a key institution, um, Stanford, here at the University of Minnesota, the Nature Conservancy and the World Wildlife Fund, and they saw the need to develop the science basis to actually be able to implement the value of nature in, in um, decision-making processes. And so they created the Natural Capital Project as um, basically in a collaboration amongst these key partners, they added the Chinese Academy of Sciences uh, in 2017. So they now have a, a third um, academic partner. And 
they pursue the transformation they're trying to create with it in a few ways. One, developing the, the science and the tools and the invest uh, software um, is at the core of actually being able to consider the value of ecosystem services and in spatial planning and in other decision making processes. They host um, and steward networks of natural capital practitioners and professionals. They have their symposium, which is annual, coming up again in March 2019. And then they work um, with different decision making um, entities. For example, they were a key partner in uh, the country of Belize and their um, coastal management plan. All right, so those are the groups I looked at, the collectives I looked at, and a little basic understanding. So now we're gonna jump into findings. And before I do, I just wanna note, there's a tension here because I'm focused specifically on these collectives, and obviously these transformations are much bigger than a single collective. And all of the people I interviewed, all the people associated with these collectives would not claim the success of the overall transformation they're trying to create. It may sound a little bit like that when I talk about that, but I wanna be clear that they are key actors, but they are not the only actors in these systems. ASU uh, transforming itself can claim that more than the others perhaps, but they also are trying to have a broader impact than, than only their university. All right, so findings gets a outline as well, um, and I'm gonna go through each of these. First, um, at its core, driving transformation takes connecting a transformational idea with the power to actually drive that transformation into the mainstream. Um, and then we'll go through the rest of these as I talk about my findings. So this I, I didn't come into this work with the idea about the power of ideas, but it came up throughout my interviews and increasingly emerged as important. And the words of Michael Crow, I believe in the authority of the idea as opposed to the authority of the person, so I think power should be a function of ideas as opposed to individuals because, because all of us are temporary. And so what does this power of a transformational idea in the context of sustainability mean? Because I'm not just talking about deliberate transformation, although many of these lessons apply for deliberate transformation. I'm also talking about um, deliberate transformation towards sustainability. And in the context of sustainability, it's important to ask what is necessary and use um, what we know from science to help uh, define what is necessary. So those, those many reports I showed you earlier are an important part of transformation towards sustainability. And all of the, the collectives, all the people I interviewed in the collectives, well, it emerged out of many of the interviews that the science also says speed really matters when it comes to sustainability. So part of that transformation, the, the fast, the how fast we do it matters. As one of the people from 350 said, uh, lo or winning too slow on climate change is actually losing. Um, and then attention to justice um, and in trying to drive transformation recognizing that power relationships are changing and that um, acknowledgement of the justice implications, implications of that is an important part of sustainability. None of these collectives felt like they were, had figured it out in terms of justice, but they all highlighted it as important. 350, for example, makes it their uh, number one principle and the three principles that they worked on. All right, so as an example, and I, I, I'm gonna use an example for, I'm not, I have examples from all the collectives for each of these, but I don't have time to discuss all of that. We can maybe talk in the Q&A, but I'll give some examples in findings from the different collectives. So again, going back to this do the math tour, the transformational idea here is not one that 350 made up. It comes out of a report from the Carbon Tracker Initiative back in 2011 about unburnable carbon. Basically the idea of a carbon budget and how much we can um, burn in order to stay under two degrees Celsius. And Bill McKibben wrote this you know, kind of scholarly article up into a publication in Rolling Stone, which got it out a little bit. But 350 then um, used this idea of unburnable carbon to start the divestment movement, and that the value of fossil fuel industry is based on fossil fuel reserves that we cannot, that we cannot burn if we are going to maintain a safe climate for us to live in. And, uh, the board chair of 350 described it. He said, I give Bill McKibben an enormous amount of credit for having an instinct for seizing on an idea. Few of 350's ideas are really original, and burnable carbon and do the math was languishing in the obscurity of an academic, of academic research that we all knew, we sort of knew it, and we walked by it. And Bill and 350 said, no, that, there's really power in that idea. And they were right, there really was power in that. And there isn't power in any idea until you get out there and you flog it. And they were just willing to really, you know, 21 cities, the whole do the math tour, they, tour, they just really leaned into drawing out the power of the idea. 
So you need to have, you need to build the power into the idea. All right. Um, so part of doing that with a collective is coupling this top-down idea, this top-down purpose, with the bottom-up vitality of many people contributing. And doing this enables building widespread power based on the energy, the resources, the vitality of many people, and then focusing it to reshape the power in the broader system. And so that's, that, that's what these collectives do. And that creates um, a collective power. And they, they all had early success in doing this. They all, they, they came out of sensing kind of the energy of the system, the, the leaders and the people associated with the collective. So um, through the Natural Capital Project came out of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment when there was a lot of excitement about the ecosystem services. Um, 350.org was not the only uh, entity to see the need for a climate movement. There was another group called One Sky that actually ended up um, combining with 350 as over time. So they sensed this energy of many people to try to do something and they, they found a niche and harnessed it. And then pivoted into being able to do that kind of top-down focus on purpose with bottom-up vitality over time, which is, was really important for um, driving the transformation over the timescales we need. So together, this bottom-up this top-down, bottom-up creates a kind of collective power um, to actually drive transformation in the system. So how do the functions and use of the different elements of um, transformation, narrative, leadership, and networks build, build, go into this top-down purpose coupled up with the bottom-up vitality? Um, so I'll start with narrative. And the narrative is the story of what the collective aims to do, why, and how. Um, and it aligns and unleashes the power of people acting and, and they, they can all then bring their, their resources to focus purpose. And there's different parts of narratives. There, there's the overall what the collectives are trying to do, and then there's also examples of people doing the, the work of the collectives. Um, so there's a, there's a three level that fits with the bon top down, bottom up, and coupling. You have the purpose, which is the, the top down, and then you have the tactics, which is this widespread, um, many people working on the collective, and the strategies kind of couple that. There's a sort of set of strategies within the purpose. Um, so for 350, they want to, uh, say 350 in the atmosphere, they want to have a safe level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And their original strategy was just showing widespread support for doing this. Um, and then they've developed the divestment strategy to keep it in the ground, um, uh, pushing back against fossil fuel infrastructure, which Keystone XL Pipeline is part of it. Um, increasingly, they, they have a focus on 100% renewable energy. That sort of happened after I did most of my research, so I haven't focused as much on it. And then the tactics come from the creativity of activists around the world. Um, so with divestment, it started originally in universities, but then there's churches and local governments, now national governments, pension funds, and we're actually up to about $6 trillion that have been committed to divestment at this point. Um, Arizona State University, their transformational idea is the New American University and sustainability is also part of the core. They have a set of strategies um, related to increasing the scale of the number of students that they can um, educate. They're up to almost 100,000 students a year at ASU. They've got some interesting partners with um, Starbucks and Uber are some examples. Um, they also have some strategies like the School of Sustainability, which is an all-in um, on a specific topic area um, and they also have restructured the university itself and their, their research enterprise to not so much align with disciplines, but align with the, the challenges they're working on. And then the tactics up, tactics come from lots of, the creativity of lots of different people. So uh, uh, one of the interviewees here described Arizona State University as a yes university. If you want to try to do something, the answer is yes. And it might not be successful, but um, they want you to try out different things and new centers and research initiatives and their support for that kind of work. Um, okay, now turning to leadership. And as I said before, I was interested in collective leadership, um, which is emergent out of the collective and cannot be separated from the collective, um, and also widespread leadership from individuals as part of the collective. collective. So the collective leadership I saw really as being enacted through um, leadership roles. And I, this, there's a whole literature, uh, leadership is a whole field in itself. So there's a lot we could talk about here. But the idea of not only focusing on individuals, but on the roles these individuals play um, and how they connect this 
top-down purpose and bottom-up vitality through different leadership roles. So the visionaries, these are the ones that we can often identify with a collective. Um, your Bill McKibben, your Michael Crow, Gretchen Daly, with the examples in this um, study. Uh, and they identify and articulate and maintain focus on purpose. Um, that's their main role. Change agents are the people we, out, we see out trying to make change and they have their creativity that's coming up into this common purpose. Facilitators, I think, are essential but, but often less appreciated. They play the coupling role. They communicate in multiple directions, bringing information up trans and down and sideways, and they play essential support roles for others. They're really highly driven by purpose. So the Natural Capital Project is a really great example of these leadership roles. You have the founders, um, particularly Gretchen Daly in the visionary role. Change agents are their partners in different countries, um, different academic co collaborators. Facilitators are um, lead scientists um, who are highly motivated by the purpose of natural capital and, and work in really complex leadership environments to connect this huge idea of all decision-making processes considering the value of nature with the actual functional um, ability to do that by many actors around the world. And then practices to foster widespread leadership. Um, at its core, these collectives are focused on a culture of excellence around the work that they do and achieving their purpose. And they pair that with not having shame around failure. And so they ask people to experiment, to push themselves. And if it doesn't work, it's OK. And you keep going, and you learn, and you keep trying. Um, and ASU, as I said, was described as a, a yes university. 350.org really trusts its activists. They see themselves as providing tools and platforms and communication sort of boxes of activism, so to speak. And um, one of the leaders of 350 said, we inspire our network. We might coordinate, but we coordinate through mission, through values, through stories and strategies so that people really get what we're doing and who we are and why the bigger we here is important. And then they, these teams and individuals, run with it. They copy it, they grab it, they use it. So um, 350 provides a lot of the tools. And, and importantly, these tools are open source and they're crowdsourced, meaning that people contribute into the tools to support leadership and also um, they're widely open in support of the mission. So NatCap's Invest software tool is completely open source. They even developed a whole um, GIS software underneath it so it could remain open source. They could get it off a proprietary expensive software. Um, they also um, provide support and training and there's essential aspects of team leadership and supporting um, practices of widespread leadership. All, all of the, er, Natural Capital Project and 350 were started by really tight-knit teams, and they all recognize the value of the teams. And for example, ASU um, has leadership training that's, that works with individuals and also with teams trying to develop their leadership. And finally, uh, networks. And as I talked about, networks are really important in the literature. And I, I ended up differentiating between two kinds of networks. One is internal networks, and this is not as discussed in the literature. Internal networks are made up of what are called bonding ties among homogenous groups, sort of the in-group. These are all really complex groups, organizations. They're complex entities trying to create change. So being aware of how they are organized <laughs> internally actually matters to them. And these internal networks help organize identity around purpose, and they organize resources around purpose. They also enable the collectives to move fast. Um, they don't have really large bureaucratic decision-making processes. NACAP kind of can use which one of its partners they can <laughs> most easily advance more quickly rather than getting stuck in the bureaucratic processes of universities or large organizations. Um, ASU really excuse bureaucratic processes. It's not an excuse for not being able to do something <laughs> at the university based on, on my conversations there. And 350 really just doesn't plan a more than a year in advance because they see their ability to be nimble as really an essential part of their ability to do the kind of work they want to do. Um, and then external networks, and this is really the contributing to scaling and maintaining focus over time. Um, that's more in the literature. And I didn't develop as much an understanding of the purpose of external networks because I think that's quite well documented. But external networks um, on the, what I did develop a better understanding of is how that, how these collectives think about their external networks and enter into them. They all, every person I interviewed said networks are important, external networks are important. 
Um, and they talked about the importance of um, growing into networks. So engaging with networks is, is time and resource intensive, and you need to enter in with a, a sense of who you actually are and what you actually offer and what you actually want to get out of being involved in the network. And importantly, these networks, uh, the, these collectives um, enter into the next networks with a sense of being humble and generous, and they're also clear about their role in the network and their purpose in the network, and also who they want to partner with um, as, as having more intense um, network connections, partnerships, collaborations, versus just knowing each other. So um, growing into networks and being clear about the role and purposes of networks um, is a really important part of how these collectives function. All right, so uh, moving to the, the final findings, some general overall observations. Um, first, I talked at the beginning as one of the key elements of transformation is transformation playing out over space and time and having different strategies and roles um, as both the context of transformation and the, the transformation in collective itself changes. And that, that they're difficult to bring about, as I said, and they unfold over long time frames. So collectives are actually a way to handle dealing with change over time and over spatial scales. They create a, a platform. Um, so I didn't end up um, thinking so much about the strategies and the approaches at different points in time, but rather that collectives themselves are really important as um, transformation plays out. And this, this aligns with a finding um, from Wesley uh, 2017, who studied several transformations, historical transformations, and pulled out learnings from that. And they found that coherence of principles, um, so what the transformation they were actually trying to create matters, and there is not a consistency of practice. The approaches, the strategies, what they're trying to do changed over time depending on the needs of the system and the context. So that was something I very much found in these collectives is a coherence of their principles, what I identify as purpose, and the, the practice changing over time in response to the, the needs of driving transformation. And also, I've been focusing a lot on what collectives can actually do, but it's important to then again step back, step back out into the system and think about the limits and possibilities of collectives. Um, and I, you could write multiple dissertations on the context within which each of these collectives work. Um, I specifically looked at the uh, context of 350.org because it's better documented than some and um, I think more intuitive for folks to understand. In driving the kind of transformational change related to climate change, um, we're working in slow governance processes, processes that are slow and complicated by design. And you're working to, to create change when there's powerful incumbent actors or actors that are already there um, who are both opposing your change and incumbent actors who might be on the same side of you but not want to work in the same way or might be challenging to partner with. Um, the fossil fuel industry is a, is a key one in this um, with the amount of money the fossil fuel industry has spent resisting change um, and the kind of doubt campaigns in the, to sow doubt in the science of climate change. Even, even still, as we have this overwhelming scientific evidence, the, the climate change, people talking about the doubt around climate change are still on national media outlets on a fairly regular basis. Um, and, and also, the U.S. is really increasingly polarized around issues of climate change. It's become almost completely partisan as the country itself has become more partisan. Um, climate change has become part of partisan identity, which makes it a really difficult space to work in um, collaboratively and pro pro productively on solutions. Um, at the same time, the climate movement has made, there's evidence the climate movement has made some uh, advance in creating transformation. I think pipelines are a really interesting example. The Keystone XL pipeline, um, President Obama um, denied the permit of the Keystone XL pipeline. And, and they, there was a whole bunch of reasons they chose Keystone as, a, as an example, not one of which is that the president gets to decide with a, a transnational pipeline. Um, and so that was a big win for the climate movement. And then uh, the Trump presidency happened. The Trump administration came and they reversed that decision. So you could say then a loss for the climate movement. But just in the last month or so, a judge said, you haven't actually made the case enough. You haven't paid enough. You haven't described the, the climate issues around the reversal of decision enough. So they stayed the decision on the Keystone XL pipeline. It may still get reversed, but 
the judicial system is now saying, you have to consider climate change. And that's a pretty big deal. You have to consider climate change in the permitting of this fossil fuel infrastructure. We're not sure how that's gonna play out, but it's a sign that driving this transformational idea by the climate movement is affecting the larger government system, the larger governance system. And so that is really, um, what I, when asking the question of how collectives drive deliberate transformation to make progress towards sustainability, they don't control the transformations we're trying to uh, bring about, they're trying to bring about. But they, they take a transformation idea, they identify, they don't necessarily make them up, but they identify um, an, a transformation idea and then they build the power to drive it into mainstream practice and discourse. And these transformation ideas are essential inputs into the overall process of deliberate transformation. Not the only thing, certainly not the control, uh, not, uh, something that these collectives fully control, but they provide essential inputs into deliberate transformation. All right, some future research is <laughs> coming out of this. There's a few areas that I think um, would be really important to focus. One is on power, and power is how do we actually create the kind of changes we wanna bring about. And both in changing the incumbent power structures um, that are, that exist and how these transformational collectives don't either get crushed by incumbent power structures or co-opted by their potential partners in these power structures. Um, and leadership, collective leadership and sustainability is, is an area of research that's been very little studied and I think um, collective leadership is an important part of our sustainability challenges in addressing them. So that's an area I would like to see more research. And specifically as the three levels, roles of research, uh, leadership I identified, looking at how those go across scales um, and the role of facilitators. And finally, I think maybe most importantly, the tensions between persistence and transformation. Um, what are the things about our society? What, what are essential to the cultures that may be um, forced to move off their small island state? Um, what are the governance processes that we need to hold on to tight to make sure that we have as we uh, navigate our way through these transformations. So it, I would say a critical lens of, of transformation is essential but not the only important thing. We also need to be thinking about what, what we need to hold on to and, and help persist. All right, I have, at the end of this, <laughs> I have some gratitude, I have many thanks um, that I wanna say before I wrap up and have a conversation with you. First, I really, the, the interview, the people I got to interview were, are some of the people doing the hardest, most important work we have, and I'm so grateful they gave me their time and insight um, that I was able to share some of it with you. My committee, as Steve said, I took a winding process and they were patient with me as I tried to navigate that and made lots of different decisions that slowed things down and sped things up at various times. I had some great funding from the Graduate School Fellowship um, the Regent Scholarship, I had a thesis travel grant, uh, the writing retreat for dissertations here at the U, and INE has, was an es essential home for me, both uh, as developing as a professional and intellectual. John Foley literally gave me a desk there when I started as a grad student, that's how I got connected, and then Jessica Hellman continued um, to make that a home for me. Um, and the students, the hundreds of students I got to work with through the Boris Leadership Program were both inspirations um, and reasons for doing the work. And, I, I have a lot of amazing women in my life, I recognize as I <laughs> was writing this up, and I, I'm, I can't name them all, but I had three core groups. I had a group of four women who we all took How to Excel in grad school our first year together, and I am the fourth final of them to finish a degree, hopefully, today. Um, and I had a lady lunch bunch, as we called ourselves, from the Institute on the Environment, and we would get together and talk about our careers and ideas um, and how to navigate them. And then I have a group of friends from high school who mostly we send each other group text messages who uh, helped me navigate being a professional and a mom in the last few years. And then finally, my family. My in-laws are here. They've provided essential support, particularly child care in the last few years. Um, my godmother who's here watching the live stream and she's my most important career mentor, Elaine Johnson. My other godparents are here as well who provide really key support. And my parents, my mom, Joanne Knuth, defended her dissertation last May. We actually ha were in the same building here at the university for a few years as we worked on our dissertations. And my dad um, as well, who's been just a champion of um, smart, powerful women and I really appreciate him being here. And then finally, my husband, Sam, um, I probably will tear up with this one. He, uh, 
fundamentally believes in the importance of my work and my ability to do it, and that's something I, I have never felt a, a bit of doubt. And uh, we've been blessed with Maude a few years ago, and she is um, why I work so hard to try to understand the world and to make it better. And so, I want to take, before I go into questions, some key takeaways. Um, transformation's happening, and we get to decide how much of it is deliberate and how, how much of it is forced. Those are a really big, big question. Ideas matter in this transformation, and transformational ideas depend on asking what's necessary, not just what's possible. And in trying to drive transformation, we need to be rigorous, both in science, but also in other understandings of the systems. And ideas are essential, but they're not enough. We need to build power to reshape power to drive these ideas. And in doing so, relentless focus on purpose and impact. And then finally, building structures and support for many to offer leadership as part of driving these ideas is essential to transformation. And now I'd like to have a conversation with you about the kind of, uh, our ability to drive the kind of transformations we need. Thanks. Okay. Uh, do you have the microphone? Right here. Okay, so are there any questions? The committee gets to ask questions later, so we start with the audience. Thanks, Kate. That was amazing. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm curious about uh, the, whether dissent showed up as dissent. a thing. Um, so dissent and difference yeah. and um, because just from five years here at the University of Minnesota, if someone were to interview like yeah. university leaders about how they drove change, they wouldn't <laughs> talk about the students who like disrupted things and said, yeah. Don't, um, <laughs> And, and and I mean, yeah. I, uh, but in in everything that I'm seeing and learning about how racial justice work yeah. happens, like it's dissent, it's being able to deal with uncomfortable things. Mm -hmm. That being in a, a zone of discomfort pushes you to change. And yeah. I was curious whether that sh showed up. Yeah. Or so I I would say the word dissent was probably less common, but the discomfort and the pushing by what's necessary as opposed to what's possible. And so, for example, um, with 350, I interviewed um, a woman from the Sierra Club uh, who was a key partner with them. And I asked about you know, being in networks and partnering with them, and she said, well, I want to push back. 350 is not an easy partner. They're not, nece they're not necessarily easy to work with, she said, but we recognize that they've opened up space for us to be able to do more in the climate work that we are trying to achieve. Um, and this focus on purpose can be very uncomfortable, um, but I think if you're clear about that, it, others can understand what you're doing, and even if they're not comfortable with it, they, they um, appreciate and are willing to work with it. Um, I, the, uh, the role of incumbent, like, so we, you can talk about like the fossil fuel industry as a really powerful actor spending way more money. That's part of it, but there's also dissent within trying to do good work and trying to do transformational work. And I think that's a key thing about starting with what's possible versus what's necessary um, and making what's necessary possible. And I think you're right, dissent matters um, and is important. Um, yeah, and managing is, is a big part of it. Thanks. Um, thanks for just talking about transformation. Today. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I have a follow-up. Maybe this fits in that, and I think I might be overlaying some of my own personal okay. struggle on this. So, yeah. But I was just wondering, sort of, about scoping this, like what a collective is, and I was thinking especially about like the bottom-up piece, mm -hmm. because I was thinking about how these are all very sort of top-down organizations. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm thinking a lot right now about like what, especially when it comes to local struggles, yeah. like what happens organically on a local level, you know, and there might be parallel struggles at a national yeah. scale, but sort of what that collective might look, how that might look different, and whether there's literature about, about something like that. And I just think like ideas that started yeah. to come to mind were like Black Lives Matter or, mm -hmm. or Standing Rock or some of these other really like yeah. uh, l recent iconic struggles. Um, I think oh, there is, a, I, I think the idea of fully bottom up 
I mean, all of these have some bottom up. ASU is a little more, <laughs> there, there's a little more um, complexity there, but the, the top down, part of what comes from it, the power of the top down is that it's sensing the, 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 the multiple collectives trying to do this work here and there, crystallizing it into an actual purpose and strategy for driving change over large periods of time. Um, and so Black Lives Matter, I think we don't have the same, I, I mean, I don't, and I don't know this as well, <laughs> the, the, the movement as well. Um, but in terms of the, the actual specific purpose, I'm not sure what it is. And, and others might be able to better articulate it. Uh, but that can, I think there is that bottom up change is potentially driving transformation. But having that bottom up focus through um, something more of a top down um, allows a more focused, potentially faster way of driving transformation. Um, so again, I think there is good work that could potentially be, become transformative um, as it, there's some work on, in, look at work on institutional entrepreneurship, potentially, although you have to wade through some academic um, uh, nuance there, um, that you can kind of bring things together and eventually it transforms as different groups come together. Um, but in terms of deriving ideas, what I found in the collectives I studied was this top down, bottom up was really an important dynamic. Um, and to be able to hook into a, a bigger, say, national narrative or international narrative, I think lifts up the ability of smaller local groups to drive change. Um, and I think that's really one of the powerful things about 350 and the climate movement is um, giving a, a sense of direction and a set of tools to large numbers of people who are desperate, like there are people desperate to drive change on climate change. And so they managed to tap into an energy that was just really looking for that focus and that set of tools. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Hi, Kate. Uh, so as you know, the University of Minnesota is about to undergo a pretty major leadership transition. I know. <laughs> so I'm curious <laughs> from your discussions with ASU in particular, were there any lessons that you learned that you think could or should apply to the future of the University of Minnesota as we look to the future? Yeah, I, well, I wrote an op-ed if you want to read in Min Post. Um, uh, but that's mostly, I think, the two big challenges of our time are democracy and climate change and sustainability, and they're related, very closely related. Um, w the University of Minnesota and ASU are very different universities. Um, and I asked Michael Crow specifically what about, a, I, I mean, ASU, was a fertile place for transformation. And he said he was looking for a university, as he called, that was not yet mature, um, that didn't have a strong culture. The University of Minnesota has quite a strong culture, and it's a culture of distributed governance um, with the university senate and the faculty governance um, and really strong identities within academic units that are, frankly, I think would be very difficult um, to bring together around the same um, sense of transformation. Uh, I would be interested in to see it, but I think it, this is a place where it's more difficult. And it's a, it, that's not to say it's necessarily bad, but it is, it's, just, it's a very different kind of university um, than ASU especially was um, in the early 2000s. We have a couple of things. <laughs> personal question. Oh, no. Oh, yeah, not too personal. <laughs> not too soft. Yeah. Well, for grandma and me and those <laughs> older people, your mom and dad, we're fine, you know, as far yeah. as climate is concerned. Yeah, talk to Dan. Dan will, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> but when you were presenting this, I'm thinking about your daughter, Maud, what it's going to be like for her when she's our age. Mm -hmm. So what, um, especially when you have leaders in government who would not exactly agree with you. So do you think the sustainability will sustain? be successful for your daughter? Well, that's a, that's a hard question. Um, I will, I'll give you a very honest, somewhat vulnerable answer. As I was writing this up, I think I had some conversations with my advisor. I said, I don't know if we can do it. Um, but we have to. And that's the, um, that's the answer I come to, is that we have to transform. Um, the other part was. And so uh, I, I don't know 
but we have to, so I guess we're gonna. Can we be successful we can. in spite of leadership governments? Um, again, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I've done a lot of thinking about democracy and, and climate and sustainability, and I think they are inextricably intertwined. Um, and so reviving the health of our democracy is at its core climate work. Um, so we will see. <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm my age. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Kate. Hi. Congratulations. Um, I hate to bring this down to like a more cynical note. Uh, that's why well, I felt like that was a fairly, for me, that was a well, fairly cynical thing. Fair enough. <laughs> okay, so to continue the cynical yeah. trend then. Um, but I just was thinking about when you mentioned ASU's policy of saying yes to everything. Yeah. Um, I just wrote a big dollar sign in my notebook. Yeah. You know, like where I'm curious to hear how your interviewees discussed money and funding and um, gathering resources in general. Yeah, so we, I didn't specifically ask about money. It did come up in a few key ways. Um, they've all been quite successful at getting money um, uh, in key moments. So for example, the Natural Capital Project, they got an early private funder um, that gave them um, some resources to work with. Um, that gave them some flexibility, money that they still have. Um, I'm not sure all of it, but significant, uh, important part of their ability to, to try to do some innovative, creative things. Um, and also with NatCap, money came up in that they, um, part of their strategy is in increasingly working with networks that have lots of money <laughs> and influencing those, those institutions. So like a development bank, they work with the Inter American Development Bank or um, working with companies that control large parts of a commodity market. So some groups might want to transform that, the whole capitalist structures, but uh, NACAP is trying to work through those networks to get the value of nature into it, and that involves money. Um, ASU raises a lot of money, and they have as one of their goals like hundreds of millions of dollars of research money. And it's not for the purpose of having money, but it's for the purpose of what you're describing, of being able to do innovative things. Um, and I think that clarity of purpose and people understanding what they're doing why it's important and how they're doing it is a virtuous cycle for attracting important resources like money. Yeah. Yes. I'm really interested uh, that you want to study purpose the, uh, or the questions about power yeah. um, more, um, especially since you have a background <laughs> in politics and I think related yeah. to purpose and money. Um, when I got to know you, I really came to understand um, how lacking our politics are in people with science and technical quantitative knowledge. Yeah. And so understanding something like uncertainty in climate models or even the urgency of the timing of changing happening now um, might be something that people hold, who hold the reins of power just don't understand. So I wonder if in your research or your personal thinking um, how that's played out now. Um. I, I would say in terms of, of politics, uh, many choose not to understand. You don't need to be a scientist at this point with climate change. Like the science of ecosystem services and NACAP, there was a lot of science work to do and there still is. Um, the science of climate change is not something that we need to like understand the nuance, nuance of in terms of the need to drive action. So I see that as much more of sort of a brute power thing than I do as a scientific understanding thing. Um, and, you know, I think there's some interesting, I think you, you're aware of the Sunrise Movement. If you're interested in climate movement work, check out the Sunrise Movement and their work on the Green New Deal um, as a kind of, an, uh, I think, a really potentially powerful, I'm not sure what, how it'll play out, but it's one of the places I'm looking. Um, and it's rooted in science. 350 is rooted in science, um, but they're not doing science and they're not looking at, like, super nuanced understanding of science. Because um, I don't, to do what we need to do on climate change, that's not, I don't think that's really the limiting factor. Um, and I think there's been a lot of work <laughs> uh, by people want, not wanting to have the kind of change needed to, to reduce emissions um, to sow doubt. I mean, it's well documented in the Merchants of Doubt book and other places. Um, and that they want the science to be the conversation. Um, instead of the solutions and the need to move pretty big and fast. <laughs> yeah. 
Thanks, Kate. This is great work. Okay. I'm curious how your research has changed how you see your own role as a transformational agent and if if you have uh, a sense of what, what <laughs> yeah. you want to do next and whether sort of where on the hierarchy or sort of spectra from visionary facilitator down a change agent you see your potential for uh, doing <laughs> next things. Well, I, I think that... Uh, I, I would say the, the short answer to that question is um, I really take the IPCC report, 1.5 degree report, the National Climate Assessment, and so I, the question I am asking myself is not so much what is the career I've set up myself up for, um, which I say would probably be more of an academic career, maybe, maybe not actually, but um, <laughs> the question is where can I do the work that has the most impact now? Like we're looking at a decade, uh, which seems really stark to say, but that's, that's what these reports are saying. Um, so that's the question that I want to ask, my, that I am asking myself and that I hope many other people are asking themselves. Um, and I think from this research, it's clear that I think there's, one, there's a book that I would, if you're interested about movements especially called How Change Happens. It came out this year. Um, lots of books I was cited in my dissertation came out in the last year or two. Um, uh, being part of a group that is trying to drive transformational change is I think an important thing that all of us can do. This is, as a, it's not individual work. Um, so being thoughtful about that and finding your people to work with as a team and then as a larger collective, I think, is an important part of answering that question. Yeah. Hey, Kate. Hi. Um, <laughs> There's so many wonderful people from my, my winding path here. Oh. Nice to see you. It's so good to see you. Um, so this is just fantastic work. I'm just curious, as you went around and talked to different collectives, yep. did you find an organizing tool for people who want to be engaged? Because I think your, your comment about um, the, the strong desire of people to find a way into yes. this work, yeah. um, and especially the work of racial equity and other major yeah. social um, issues facing our community is really strong, but there is not that sort of tool that we can use, and I'm just curious if you have any insights to share about that. Um, in terms of uh, specifically on racial equity work or on just tools in general? Um, I think, as it, it, Heather's the planning director for the city of Minneapolis, not to out you, but she has, she has a plan, but to out you. Um, uh, uh, I think leaders of nonprofits, of universities, of governments, thinking intentionally about how to help people do not just busy work, but productive work, I think that's a, it's an essential question. Um, and, it's not an easy one to answer, and it can be very slow, it can be very frustrating because our systems aren't set up to have all of the different people in our society productively engage with them in our governance systems. Um, so I don't, I, the learnings from my study um, are being clear how it fits into overall work um, and having an open source approach that the, the tools are not about the organization, they're not about the institution, but they're about what we're try, trying to achieve together. Um, and this can be very difficult in public work, especially I think important, but trusting people to use those tools with the intent with which they're created. And that was something that I really was impressed with by 350 is <laughs> They just have people around the world running with it. I mean, they, they made tool, they, they have pictures, they have videos, they literally created a font for the climate movement <laughs> as a tool, which I now like recognize, the Klima font, you'll see it on various posters a lot of times, and it's, it's like, oh, there's, there it is. Um, and it's a free open source font for the movement, because they were like, well, what do we need? Well, big signs, we mobilize people. They let, you know, let's, they, and they, it's not about 350, but it's about a tool for the movement. Um, so that's an important distinction is, is I was very focused on collectives, but it's a tool for the broader purpose. Um, and that can be a tension because our organizations do need to sustain themselves. Um, but if we're, if we're trying to drive transformation, that's, that's 
what they need to be focused on. So it's, there's a tension there. Um, but one, I think I was impressed with how these groups navigated. And maybe we'll take two, two last okay, questions. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations, thanks, this thanks. is amazing. Um, so I'm really, I'm, I'm thinking about kind of the inside outside yes. in terms of systems and action and policy. And I'm really curious, the, the interviews and, and all the research you've done, kind of what insights you have about how this type of work, you know, how it is happening maybe in more formal kind of government systems or, yeah. you know, I'm thinking about like a lot of these are kind of pushing outside, creating. Yeah. And I did I didn't say that this is a, you know, a long thing written. I, I intentionally didn't choose government. Right. As <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm just curious, are there, are there themes that apply? Is it a totally different beast? Are there lessons that can be learned um, in some of those more formal, like you said, large, slow moving yeah. um, I think it's systems. important. I think um, you know, people w have often asked me, how do, you, how do you decide who to vote? And I tend to be interested in people in government who are comfortable being pushed and who want to be pushed. Um, and rec and, and, and um, people in, say, in movements or trying to drive transformational change and other types of collectives um, also need to recognize the limitations of the people, they're, people in government they're working with, but not be stopped by that um, to still push. Uh, so I would say in government, having, um, Leaders who, well, one, are actually talking about what's necessary, <laughs> and two, who are comfortable with engaging in real back and forth with people who are trying to drive transformational change. Um, but yeah, that, that inside outside thing is interesting. And th there's a lot, you know, watching the city of Minneapolis with the newly elected people, even watching with the new Congress um, and the work happening on members around a new Green Deal is really pretty interesting. Or a Green New Deal, I'm sorry, Green New Deal. Like the New Deal except green. <laughs> a lot of things in my head right now. Um, that's, some, that's something I would look at as kind of an interesting inside outside process. There was one more, hi. Yeah, hi Kate. So thank you, that was wonderful. And I often, when I, I talk about moments of transformation that yes. I've witnessed. Yes. A couple of examples I want to give because they're things you know about really well. Yeah. Um, one is in 2007 when yeah. our state legislature had a bipartisan moment and passed these really strong climate and energy. renewable yeah. energy goals, on, you know, almost unanimously. Um, and then also the marriage equality yes. process of going from almost banning same-sex marriage to legalizing it in a few years. And yeah. again, that was a very political process that we lived, yeah. and I wonder, I don't know if they fit into your framework or yeah, not, they um, do. but I always use them as examples that, hey, this has happened before and it can happen again. Yeah. That's how I know it can happen, but do you think there's validity to that? And do you, I don't know. Yeah, I think there, so I, the marriage equality is a really good example um, of this sort of, uh, there's the overall purpose. We are going to, we're advancing marriage equality, and that's actually one of the examples in the, I show, I'll show you the book. That <laughs> if you're interested in this, it's one of the examples in this book. Um, and uh, they, she identifies um, a, a network strategy of um, groups in different states, which she calls a 10-10-10-20 strategy. So 10 states are trying to um, do domestic partnership, or 10 states are working through the courts, or 10 states are trying to pass full marriage equality just legislatively. I don't know, I don't remember exactly all of this, but they're part of this bigger purpose of full marriage equality and recognition that not every place is at the same, same stage of transformation. And I think what you're identifying is transformation can, once it starts to move, happen quite quickly. Um, there are moments in transformation where it happens quite fast. But if you've really looked at it, it didn't come out of nowhere. <laughs> I mean, you were an essential person in the 2007 policy changes here. You worked for years. You went all over the state and talked to anyone who would listen, right? And there was other folks doing that, um, intentionally organizing. Uh, the, uh, the Democrats made clean energy a campaign issue that year. 
And so when elected and getting different types of power in the governance system, the transformation could happen quite quickly. Now it's not far enough to do what we actually need to do on climate change, but it was a key moment. Um, so I think the lessons of having a big overall purpose and different strategies in different places is important and that, that through a network. Um, and then the transformation itself can happen, can be in public consciousness and happen quite quickly, but there was a lot of work that is happening before it actually comes about. And I think the one to watch right now that I'm, is um, change on uh, gun violence. I think um, the Moms Demand Action and the young people, especially with the Parkland students, we're at a potential, I hope, <laughs> tipping point with that transformation. Um, and I, I hope the climate stuff as well, but that I'm less certain about. <laughs> um, and I think the, 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 the gun safety one actually has a lot of parallels with the Mothers Against Drunk Driving as a historic transformation in our culture shift around, um, around drunk driving. Thank you. Great. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Kate, for wonderful, thoughtful answers and a yeah. great presentation. Thank Thanks you. again. All right. So I don't get to talk too much. I have to go with them. But thank you for coming. <laughs>